expected to have those set pretty well. <laughs> ACS is a progressive organization dedicated to constitutional ideals, furthering of human rights, but we do not ever take political positions, and so nothing said here represents the espousal of a particular political position. Canada merely the espousal of progressive ideals. You should definitely check out our website and other, other events. We're really fortunate today to have with us some distinguished guests. We have Professor Charles Nesson from Harvard University, Famed evidence professor, aka Billion Dollar Charlie, known perhaps most often as an eccentric genius. But his colleagues are going to give him a much more full introduction. We also have with us his client, Bill Tenenbaum, who's a doctoral student in the physics program here at BU, and Debbie Rosenbaum, who is a 3L at Harvard University, who has been actively participating in the trial in, in, under the supervision of the lawyer the way we do with our clinical programs. Her work on that trial has been described as shockingly effective by some commentators of this. So I think we have a rare treat for us in store. Without further ado. Um, we'll be, Joel will talk also as soon as uh, I'm 
done, and Professor Nesson actually asked for me to do question and answer because he thinks that what you guys want to know about is much more interesting than anything he would say. So he's, he's very cool like that, very down to earth. Um, I think you'll enjoy him, but I figured that this would be a good way to present kind of what are we thinking about, what are we doing um, over with uh, Joel Tenenbaum and HLS. So um, just by background, this picture is uh, the legal team that was working on the case as of last spring. Um, everybody here has graduated, except for me, um, because I'm, I'm stuck with the fourth year. Uh, and this is Joel, of course. So we really had a revolving door, probably about 20 students at, um, in clinical that have worked with Joel and worked with Professor Nesson on, uh, on this case, and it's been a, a really painful uh, experience. So, uh, the reality of file sharing, I figured I would share a couple stats that I pulled together. Um, 60 million people in the U.S. alone have used file sharing uh, programs and then file share. Um, I think actually that stat is probably out of date and it's probably much more than that. Um, 32 million Americans over the age of 12 have downloaded at least one feature link movie. 80% who said they've used Peter Peer. Um, 40, this is really interesting. Only 40% feel that downloading movies and music constitutes a very serious offense, but 78% say the same of taking movies or music from a store. So our generation really <coughs> distinguishes between I'm gonna run into FYE, grab a CD, put it in my pocket, run out the door and hope I don't get caught, versus the I'm gonna click a button, now there's a song on my computer that I really wanna listen to. We, really seem to distinguish between the morality of it. However, it is not clear that the law does. Um, the last is that 64% of college students download music regularly, and I suspect that's probably higher. It's actually really hard to get the exact numbers because of obvious reasons. Nobody really wants to admit that they download music regularly, even though everybody knows everybody else is doing it. Um, this, I think, is actually a great chart because as law students, we can appreciate this. Um, <coughs> this is trends in file sharing. Um, in the U.S. So here we go. The RIAA starts filing lawsuits sometime in uh, 2003, like late 2003, Q, quarter three, quarter four. And they're like, this, we're going to use these lawsuits to deter people from file sharing. And then we see that file sharing continues to go up. Do, 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 do. Grokster, which is like one of the biggest cases in case law about file sharing, they also thought they would, that Grokster would, would uh, deter people from downloading music illegally, file sharing continues to rise. And as you can see, this only is in 2006, and since 2000, this ends in, this chart ends in 2006, and since then, it has continued to skyrocket. So no amount of lawsuits that the RIAA has filed, nor decisions rendered by the Supreme Court have changed the behavior and the continued growth of file sharing, at least in the United States. And definitely globally, this is U.S. Um, so the RIA fights peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, I'm gonna play a couple seconds of this clip really quickly, but again, I said that in 2003, they, they start this unprecedented campaign where they were gonna go into court and, and sue people for individual users for downloading music. Now in business school, the number one lesson we learn is it's bad business to sue your, to sue your customers. But that's exactly what the RIA started doing in order to deter others from continuing to download. Um, they have now filed, settled, or threatened legal actions with about 40,000 people. So everyone was like, how is Joel the one lucky in person that got caught? 40,000 other people have also been caught. The vast majority settle because it's actually cheaper to just settle for five, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a pop than it is to go to court as all of them know. Um, so, a little bit about Tannenbaum, I won't talk about this particular, and the Pirate Bay picture, which maybe Joel will talk about the day that he was on the front page of the Pirate Bay. Um, really interesting, so everyone's like, oh, so the RIA has said that they're no longer going to file any new lawsuits. Um, as of December 2008, they came out with this huge PR announcement, it was December 21st, 2008, we are no longer suing new users, but we reserve the right to. Um, 2009, they filed a whole bunch of new lawsuits. So they've created also this attempt to like say that we get that it's not really deterring anybody from, from file sharing, but we're going to continue to sue users anyway. Um, actually, I'm going to skip some copy that copy, but I encourage you all to go to YouTube uh, when this is over because 
the reason I show it is it's this 80s video that they used to play on TV of like girl with the, like palm tree bangs, right, in the 80s, and dude with like massive curls. They're sitting in front of a computer, and and they like it's this like Fresh Prince of Bel Air type uh, like song where they try to show that like uh, remember the floppy disks from old computers? You can't take that floppy and copy it because that's bad. So they started this campaign of like the idea of copying software and copying uh, songs or peer to peer file sharing wasn't just illegal, but it was wrong and it was immoral and you were a bad person for doing it. So, um, really interesting. I'll skip it in the interest of time, but if you all get a second, go to YouTube and check out Don't Copy That Copy. Good, good laughs. Um, copyright. So, I'm going to. So this presentation tends to be for non-law students, so I won't harp too much on the legality of this. But copyright is based on the Constitution. Um, so they say that they're doing this for constitutional reasons. Here's what the Constitution says. The purpose of the Copyright uh, Act is. And I mean, the, the bottom line is that there's this notion that copyright is supposed to uh, incentivize innovation and continued, uh, I guess, development of the, of the arts. So if you go back to that, if you think of that as the purpose of the copyright statute and the idea that we're trying to innovate, it presents really interesting uh, questions in today's society. And Larry Lessig, who I believe is now at Harvard, um, wrote this book, Remix, about the remix culture and when you put together a new mashup song. So like DJ, Mighty Danger Mouse, Mighty Mouse, Danger Mouse, put together the Black Album, Jay-Z and the White Album from the Beatles and created the Grey Album with this really cool new product, but you got to it by, by copyright infringement. So how do we think about remix and these, the new abilities we have to play with copyright in the 21st century? Um, this is my diagram for him. Um, so what is the punishment for copyright infringement? In this case, um, there's two. One, you can either sue for actual damages. The problem in file sharing cases is that you <coughs> cannot prove actual damage. You cannot prove how many times it was distributed, you cannot prove how many times it was downloaded, you cannot, there's no way to prove it. So the, allow, the law allows for them to sue for statutory damages as outlined by the copyright law, which was most recently examined in 99, uh, which ironically, or coincidentally, maybe is a better term, was the time when Napster just started to take off. So, they, they accepted these statutory damages of $750 per infringement to $150,000 per infringement in an era where, the, where they really weren't thinking about the Joel Tenet bounds of the world. They were thinking about Vanilla Ice, who kind of, uh, you know, copied a tune from a Queen song and then said, I didn't do it. It was, they just sounded really similar. I mean, they're thinking about the artists who, who make money, and that's why the fair, uh, for copyright, fair use is a defense because they want to allow for the use of copyrighted, uh, copyrighted materials to be used and enhanced by the public. Uh, so really quickly, Joel fights back. Here's where we are. Um, they sued Joel for 30 songs specifically, but they have him a screenshot of about 850 or so songs, but they specifically wanted to prove infringement or prove their copyright on 30 and they sued him for 30 particular songs. Um, we attempted to argue a fair use argument, which is a really interesting uh, thing that I encourage you to ask Professor Nesson about, how the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing be fair use. Um, the day we were to start trial was Monday, the last week of July, at 1.37 a.m. I had already passed out and uh, was sleeping, checked, rolled over, checked my Blackberry, and then the judge decided to, at 1.37 in the morning of trial, that we couldn't use a fair use to um, so in the end of July, a, a jury ordered Joel to pay $675,000 per, per willful infringement, which is $22,500 per song. Um, and post-trial, now we're arguing, at this point, we've argued for a new damage on two legal technicalities, and, um, or for a new trial. Um, oh, so we've argued for a new trial or for the judge to lower damages, recognizing that Three quarters of a million dollars may not be reasonable for a Joel, PhD, 26 year old to pay. It doesn't have it. 
So um, there's a little diagram in terms of statutes and sandwiches. A uh, couple things that I encourage you to ask Professor Nesson about. I won't, I won't run through these, but does fair use make sense in this case? So could this feasibly be a fair use argument? When we say fair use, what do we really mean? Um, and so we here we distinguish between works that were available with uh, digital rights management versus works that were available without. And us as users, once we buy music, we want to own our music and do whatever we want with it. So DRM does make a difference. Um, in the we had a hearing last Tuesday in front of Judge Gertner, uh, which we were trying the damages and kind of testing the waters about maybe twenty-two thousand dollars per song wasn't reasonable, to which she were asked the RIA, is there another case in the galaxy that has upheld damages to this degree? So we pulled a bunch of cases in which damages don't make sense when it's 22,500 to one, that ratio has just never been upheld in court of law. Um, so I guess the lingering question is, is it fair for some users to pay for the sins of others? Um, and I think that's all I will talk about. Door, is there
So the idea is you call this number, you give them a credit card number, and, and you pay them off. And so I call them up and they say, hi, welcome to the RIA settlement line, how would you like to pay? And, <laughs> and I said, I wouldn't. And they said, okay, but, but like MasterCard or Visa. I'm like, no, 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 I wouldn't, would not, can't pay. And so they, they claim to have this, this program for people in my situation, financial hardship. And so I like sent in stuff showing the bank balance, showing that I didn't earn serious money, stuff like that. They kept losing it, whatever. I didn't qualify. I don't know how many people actually do qualify. The Jamie Thomas case, if you're familiar with that owner in Minnesota, uh, she didn't qualify and she's apparently a single mother of two who earns 30,000 a year. So the notion of having a financial hardship plan seems kind of dubious if so, no one seems to qualify for it. So I called them up, I actually sent them a $500 money order, uh, which they returned basically saying, I mean it was sort of, their letter was, I'll say basically uh, the middle finger back to us. I mean, that was how I interpreted it uh, as a metaphor. It's sort of like, call us when you really want to talk, call us when you mean it. So we didn't hear from them for a while after that. We didn't hear from them for, I guess it was something like three, four years. And then one day in August of 2007, I came home to my apartment, and there at my doorstep at the doormat was a big stack of papers, a really big stack of papers about 50 pages thick, and I looked at it and I read some of the words to it. It said words like copyright infringement, and I had learned from the show Ghost Dragon with copyright infringement. Kind of. Have you ever watched that? It's an awesome show. So I recalled you know, vaguely what that meant, and so I called up my mom. I said, Mom, there's a big stack of papers at my door. And she is an attorney, which is lucky for me. But she's not any kind of attorney that specialized in this kind of stuff. She didn't know what Kazaa was before any of this started. If she sends an email and manages to attach something, she's very proud. <laughs> so technology is not exactly the thing. She does family law. Her basically full-time job is she works for the state of Massachusetts involving uh, custody of children in um, basically troubled households, uh, juvenile delinquency, care and protection problems. So she earns very little. But, but, she has a soul, you see. That's the thing about the legal profession, I guess. <laughs> no, really, I get lawyer jokes so well right now. Like, I used to think that I understood lawyer jokes. Now I really get them. <laughs> so we're filing back and forth with these people for a while. We show up in court, and we're there basically mixed in with all these other people who are on the same docket number. On our docket number known, which is the number that identifies the case, there are over 135, 134 people in the same situation as us. So we're not particularly remarkable. And every time that we're there, there's a different group of people who have no idea what's going on. So the judge would take time, pause, and she would address each person individually. So she would call, is, is this person there? I'd say yes. And she'd say, okay, the, they have alleged that you have infringed their copyrights. Do you know what this means? And these people often wouldn't really speak English that well, so she would take time out and explain to them what the charges were against them. These were people who already had default judgments against them because they didn't know what to do. They figure, oh, there's a lawsuit against me, I'll just ignore it. They get default judgments and the RIA just breaks that in. So what she would do in situations like that is back it up, say, well, I'll take whatever you just argued to me, I'll interpret that as an oral argument and I'll back up the judgment, but you have to answer it. You have to answer or else I have to give them the default judgment. These people just don't know that. So here we were going into the, the courtroom a number of times, and we were getting continued phone calls from one of their counsel out in Colorado who would fly every time for court. Um, and I dealt with her exclusively by phone. Now I didn't realize that you have the right to decline contact by phone. That you can demand everything in writing, an email, and letter, but instead they put everything in phone, so there's absolutely no record of anything that these people did to contact me, to harass me, to call me on a regular basis. And every time that I would talk to them, I would call my mother afterwards saying, well, she just said a bunch of stuff about the law. And so my mom would try to figure out what exactly we do to react to that. It got to the point where she was actually afraid to pick up the phone when she saw that it was from me because she was worried it was going to be about the case. So here we were with the RIA sort of breathing down our throats and um, 
trying to put up with it. And then one day, I went home and I got a letter in the mail. And what's funny is, Professor Nesson remembers this story differently. But this is how I remember it. I got a letter in the mail, a little envelope, it said from Harvard Law School. And I opened it up, I don't know anybody from Harvard Law School. It says, hi, my name is Professor Nesson. I'm an attorney, a professor of law at Harvard University at the Berkman Center. I bought one of your case. If I can be of any assistance, please don't hesitate to call. So I dialed up the number. And he says, hello. And I said, yeah, you, you said to call if, um, if you could be able to help. So, uh, yes. <laughs> and it sort of went from there. Uh, Professor Nesson began defending me. And we showed up in court. And that whole process took another like, year or so to get the trial going. Um, jury selection was kind of interesting. So I noticed a lot of you raised your hands, as good criminals, tort feasers would do. When we did jury selection, we found out that that action would get you dismissed from jury duty. Anybody who had used illegal uh, file sharing programs was dismissed from our jury duty. So we were left with a population of people who had never used Napster, Kazaa, etc., who didn't really get what it's about. I and mean, as far as they were concerned, I was some super lean hacker that was like, I don't know, beaming CDs from a store somewhere and putting it in my giant court. I don't know how I looked at them. Because the youngest person on our jury, I think, was 35. And these people were all from suburban area, and I just think they didn't relate to what this case was and sort of how the behavior worked. And the fact that this was just the common thing, the fact that this was the well that everyone was drinking from, and it wasn't that any of us spent any particular amount of time to set it up. It was just there. So none of you would be on my jury, apparently. Just too bad. So I guess the result shouldn't have really surprised me that when it came down on the last day, they said we hereby find the judgment of $22,500 per song. And then immediately everyone in the courtroom, their pen dropped to their paper, 22500 times 30, 675000 so $675,000, that's how much I am apparently uh, owe right now. So we have you know, taken the, the follow-up steps to that. As Debbie mentioned, we filed a motion for a miniature, which is to adjust the amount of the damage, uh, a new trial. And if that fails, I imagine we have more options yet. I don't really know where this is going. And I don't know, if you just look right at the laws in front of you, and the resources on one side versus the other, I guess it doesn't seem too optimistic a place to be, but I nonetheless do have faith that this is going to work out in the end. There will be some semblance of reality in the justice system that's going to get to this, that's going to see what's going on, and it's going to give a result of, you know, what would Judge Judy say? Something along the lines of that kind of rational judgment. So that's where we are right now. That's all I got.
So seriously, I'd really just like to answer your questions. Shoot. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I don't know if this is a topic you're interested in or know anything about, but I was wondering if you could speak about uh, criminal enforcement of copyright, especially with music rather than civil. Thank you. Well, I don't know too much about it. Uh, my contact with the criminal enforcement actually starts with an, an early phase of what we were dealing with here, which was the case of David Lamakia. David was uh, a student at MIT. Uh, he put together a bulletin board back in the late 90s on uh, which he invited people to contribute uh, software. Uh, and he then was distributing that software to the world. Uh, and this was the cause of tremendous consternation. Uh, it resulted in a criminal prosecution of David, which was thrown out because the copyright statute at that time required that for criminal copyright infringement, you had to be acting for a profit. And he was just putting the software up and letting people take it for nothing. So his suit was dismissed. That actually then led to an act in Congress in 1997, and subsequently an increase in the civil damages in 1999. That is, <clears throat> that's what Congress was upset about. They, in relationship to this case, they were not even in the world of peer-to-peer. -peer. It hadn't dawned on them yet. Peer-to-peer -peer was not mentioned at any point. Napster was not mentioned at any point. What the Congress was wanting was some way to deal with someone like Lamakia, who brought together as a cedar, like an original cedar, a whole bunch of, uh, in fact, encrypted software, and put it up in a way that allowed the world to share it for, for nothing. Beyond that, I can't tell you a lot about uh, the criminal side of things. It's, um, it's up to the United States government to prosecute the criminal side of copyright. It's typically been reserved for real counterfeiters, that is, people who go into the copying business willfully, knowingly, for the purpose of making a lot of money. What's the uh, fair use argument that people now, it doesn't go quite that far. Uh, it, the fair use argument is basically an argument that looks at the world from the starting point of the internet, uh, and not just the internet, the World Wide Web, the shareable, the network internet, and the viewpoint of young people coming into that environment. And what they find when they come into that environment is a world that's full of open files uh, extremely desirable open files, music files. Now, how did they get open? They were open because that's the way the music business put them out. When they put out CDs, they were putting out digital files completely unencrypted that for the sake of slipping it into your CD reader was there, shareable. So, in one sense, it's saying that the copyright holders were responsible for the environment that digital natives came into of widely proliferated, totally accessible, open music files. All right, now, fast forward to a point where the RIA starts thinking we ought to think about suing. At that point, like 2003, even the chairman of the RIAA said it wouldn't be fair to sue people for downloading music on the net until we put up an equivalent product. Uh, and so they didn't even start the lawsuits until they had uh, got iTunes underway. But when they went with iTunes, they were not going with a truly equivalent product. What you could get open on the net was an open MP3 file, unconstrained, make copies of it, use it, and whatever. And what you could get on iTunes was an encrypted product that you had to have special equipment to down, you know, that it was all right. So. The idea is that if you're going to ask the law to step in and defend your right to copyright against the uh, ubiquitously accessible open files that are out there simply for the taking, you at least have to offer a product that is as good as the one that's out there for free. Now, uh, Steve Jobs came along in 2006 
and begged the recording industry to open up the files. They started doing it in 2007. They basically finished doing it in 2009. So that during our trial, um, my son-in-law, Wayne Marshall, came in and demonstrated that you could download every one of the songs that Joel was tagged with in a completely open format for 99 cents. So that the idea basically is that what fair use, fair use ought to be looked at from the vantage point of the best interest of the consuming public. And for the consuming public to be put to a Hobson's choice between being forced to buy an inferior product or freely downloading a superior product, that's, that's an unfair choice. And the industry really shouldn't be able to come in and use the public resources of the law to force consumers to buy an inferior product. Yeah. What was the breakdown between the compensatory and punitive damages and the justification given? Well, they don't make any breakdown. The way I break it down is Joel caused at most twenty-one dollars worth of damage, and the reason, the way I get there is he is charged with downloading thirty songs, any one of which, all of which, could have bought for basically a dollar. The wholesale price is seventy cents, so that's what actually goes back to the recording company. So 70 cents times 30, 21 bucks. Now if he's got the stuff in his share folder and other people are able to download from him, but every one of those 30 songs was immensely popular. So anyone who went on Kazaa and looking for one of those songs had thousands of choices from which to choose. And had Joel not put the songs in his share folder, it wouldn't have impeded anyone in the slightest from downloading. There wouldn't be wouldn't have been one person who said, oh damn, I can't get the song peer to peer, therefore I'll go buy it. So in fact, he didn't cause the industry even a dollar of damage beyond the $21 that he would have given them had he bought all the 30 songs. All right, so I take that, the $21, and I put that against the 675,000 that he's been tagged with, and that's where we get this ratio that is excessive. Yes? It seems like the absence of uh, people on the jury who know what file sharing was really contributed to the damage awards being. Did you in any way uh, mitigate that? I mean, did you try to get people on there who do something about file sharing? Yeah, you can try, but um, you're not going to make it. It's, you're up against it. And who knows whether that's even an arguable issue on appeal. It should be. It's like amazing when you think about it that an entire generation is basically being filtered out of the jury process. That's right. We raised that issue. Yeah. We raised it, but it's fat. And now, uh, the other thing I'd say though about that is that, in my judgment, the reason why that judgment comes in so high and why Jamie Thomas is tagged with $1.92 million is because of the way the jury's actually instructed. The jury, they're, they're left without any handrails for how to value anything. It's not like they go in thinking like Judge Judy and they come out thinking like Judge Judy. They may go in thinking like Judge Judy, but then they're instructed. I direct the verdict on each of the 30 songs. If you find that Joel was willful in downloading those songs, Willful meaning he knew what he was doing, that's all. But not that I didn't know what I was doing. Just knowing what he was doing is enough to make it willful. Then you should award for each one between $750 and $150,000. All right, that's your job. Now the jury goes into the room, they say, well, let's be moderate. Let's only award 15% of what we might, a mere $675,000. It, the the $150,000 number at the top blows out any sense of reality that anybody has and defines kind of a new reality within which the jury is being told that this is what his job is. And so they do it. Yeah? Why did Judge Reuter not allow you to argue your various uh, defense? Are you guys going to kill your ability to argue it? Well, uh, it's. Uh, it's a long story, I can't really totally speak for her, but the opinion that she wrote 
is one that imagines and sees fair use as not something for the benefit of consumers at all, but sees fair use as solely for the interest of uh, creators who are wanting to stand on the shoulder of others and produce something new. So the idea of consumer <coughs> fair use is one that she just really wasn't open to at all. Well, it's a very good point. 
Uh, excessive fines is typically treated as dealing only with criminal, and yet it's a perfectly fine analogy. The idea that you can't um, impose excessive fines in a criminal context should lead a fortiori to the conclusion you can't do it in a civil context. But in fact, for legal purposes, you are proceeding under the Fifth Amendment rather than the Eighth Amendment. It's a violation of due process that somebody is being imposed upon excessively with the Eighth Amendment uh, excessive fines provision being analogy. Yeah. I was just wondering how many other cases that are comparable to Joel's have made it to trial and what was the range of results that came out? There's only one other case. That's the Jamie Thomas uh, decision came down yesterday in the Texas Junior case. Where? Give me a second, I'll find it for you. Oh, uh, if there's two, I'm so fascinated. Yeah, no, I I no just, just came back. Well, it, it's either one or two. <laughs> um, yeah, the Jamie Thomas case was tried in Minnesota. Uh, the jury, the first time it was tried, the jury came back with a judgment of $221,000 for her downloading 24 songs. The trial judge was appalled by that, um, basically organized it so that there was a new trial held a new trial, the second jury came in with the same instructions, by the way, of 750 to 150,000, with 1.92 million dollars. Uh, that judge has now remitted that down to about 55,000 dollars, giving the recording industry the choice of either accepting 55 or going to a third trial. And the recording industry has come back and said, no, we'll go for the third trial. Yeah. How do, how do you think this fits into the context, like in the criminal law, you know, we're in an era of a, you know, increasingly excessive sentences and penalties, for example. Um, people are being scapegoats of. So I was wondering what comment you have on, on that. Is Joel a scapegoat here? He, it, it, he's definitely being punished for the behavior of the entire generation. Uh, and uh, when people think about that, they say, well, that's what you have to do. I mean, what else are you going to do? So we're definitely cutting off his wrist in order to prevent the rest of the world from doing what he's supposed to do. Um, at the same time, there's a long history with the copyright statute of declarations that this statute is not penal. Uh, and the whole idea of statutory damage Originally, the way the statute is structured, there is recovery for actual damage or profit that the copyright infringer makes. Uh, and um, in some cases, it's difficult to prove those. And so the original idea was that in cases where it's difficult to prove, the real and actual damage will give you this substitute as a kind of an estimate of what it is. But the one is for the other. Um, I believe that on the history, a fair reading is that this statutory damage provision was never meant to apply in a case where there weren't real actual damages, where, where there's just nominal damage. You're not supposed to be getting $150,000 for $21 worth of damage. And, I mean, there's so, this, 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 first of all, you get immediately the constitutional problem. Your huge damage awarded for nominal damage, you're bang right into the excessiveness on its face. Um, secondly, there's the anomaly of the so-called innocent infringer under the statute. If you are an innocent infringer, that is, not willful, in fact, you didn't even know it was a violation, um, you're still covered by the statute, and you're still subject to minimum damage of $200 times the number of infringements, right? Which if you're talking about peer-to-peer, -peer, that would be huge. But when you, when you consider that, that's for someone who didn't know what they were doing was in any way illegal and didn't cause any harm. And somehow this statute is being interpreted to apply to them. Well, it doesn't make any sense. If you didn't cause any serious harm, then this statutory damage shouldn't be applied to you at all. But so far, we haven't gotten the judge to listen to that. that this is like the best argument. I think, it's, I think it's an excellent argument, and I think it's almost mandated that the court consider it because of all the law 
that says you have to avoid constitutional issues. And here the judge is looking right at the throwing this statute, at least the application of this statute, out for excessiveness when there's an interpretation that would save it from that and save the court from the idea of, of asserting that Congress actually intended such an outrageous result. Yeah? Um, how do you differentiate the physical taking of a CD uh, opposed to the downloading of music without taking? Well, I, I differentiate it because the one involves physical trespass. Uh, there's one, an actual deprivation so that you have it and another person doesn't. And it's also differentiated in um, all sorts of, uh, of uh, assessments of the way kids think. Um, kids who have no compunction at all about downloading peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, by and large, wouldn't think of going in and actually lifting a CD from the record store. Lifting a CD out of the record store, that's shoplifting. That registers with people who no, no, I don't want to do that. But just clicking uh, on the net, you know, a mouse click on the net that doesn't deprive anyone of anything physically uh, and happens completely within the structure of your own kind of home computing environment, that doesn't, that doesn't have the same kind of moral character to it, at least I haven't seen it. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that one of America's comparative advantages is our intellectual property and our ability to create it. You know, many parts of, in many parts of the world, they worry about cultural imperialism from America. And they worry about our movies and our music coming into their countries. And if, if all of the information becomes free or the barriers to the peer-to-peer -peer sharing become lower, doesn't that hamper one of America's biggest advantages in terms of what it's able to produce? how it's able to influence foreign opinion, how it's able to change and work for the betterment of people who live in societies where they may not have as much freedom and may not be able to, to express themselves as freely. Um, I'm reading a book right now, actually, called Infidel by Ayan Hirsi Ali, where she discusses the impact of uh, early of, of British and American books, romance novels, on her love life and how how she felt that she could not at all uh, express herself because of the culture that she was in, because there was no way for her to, to be, to have those sort of romantic relationships. And that's kind of the context of where this question is coming from. Well, I'm not sure what you're imagining. I, first of all, um, it's, it's, it's a, a typical kind of approach to this to imagine that unless you go after Joel in the way they went after him, that the entire publishing industry fails. Uh, but right now, if you look, say, at digital music, you can buy it in a free and open format. Uh, so there's a marketplace for MP3s it is viable, even though there is some piracy. Um, in fact, in just about every industry that you're, you're referring to, book publishing, software, music, there is some level of black market that goes along with the established market. And the balance between those is where the business lies. It's not the case that everything becomes free and no one can sell anything, first off. Second off, I don't know where you're coming from in terms of her reading these romance novels is the idea that um, the, the only reason she was able to read those is because they were copyrighted and somebody had to pay for them. What's mostly been true around the rest of the world is that IP that's produced in the United States is available for practically nothing in other countries. That is, they get huge benefit from uh, much, much more practical, perhaps, with respect to software than with uh, music. But um, many people would say if the foreign countries all had to pay the United States tariffs for everything at the prices at which the United States sets, they'd be a lot worse off rather than a lot better off. This is a, an argument that has two sides to it, and the, 
the actual practical balance, I think, lies somewhere in the middle. I think we have time for just one more question. <coughs> I'll take two more, one minute. Do <laughs> you think you would have done any better with the bench trial? Um, Yes, I think perhaps. I think perhaps. Um, I'm not sure. I really have to think that through. Is that, is that something that uh, people are looking for in the future? People who haven't uh, had this kind of time? Well, I'm not sure whether we're talking short run or long run. Um, the, right, the right of someone who is being charged with infringement to go to a jury should be of extraordinary value. The jury, I believe, is next to voting the most fundamental form of citizen involvement in our government. And yet it's been demeaned to a point where the jury is little more than a subsidiary fact finder for the judges. But the basic idea of jury trial is that you can't take a man's liberty away without a judgment of his peers. You can't take a man's property away man or woman's property away without a judgment of his peers. Now, the history of the jury trial has been one of cutting that back to a point where uh, I'm in doubt in answer to your question. I think we might have been better off um, with a bench trial. It shouldn't be that way, but that may practically be the reality. All right, yes? Yeah, just going back to your point about the difference between a shop and a city and collecting uh, your mouse and internet. Um, you were saying that you, the difference is being you're not depriving someone else of the right to have that property. You're not depriving someone else of something, correct? Um, but aren't you depriving artists of the money that you were made? Um, I mean, yes, but I'm actually making a technical argument. That is, there is a, there is a difference between um, uh, laws that applies to so-called rivalrous goods, that is, physical property, which of its nature can only be possessed by one person at a time, and non-rival risk goods, which can be re reproduced infinitely. So yes, it can be said that when Joe uh, downloads from Kazan, instead of purchasing on iTunes, that he is damaging the record industry to the tune of 70 cents. And of that 70 cents, maybe a nickel would go back to the artist. That you can definitely say. Um, that's what you can say. But then problems in the US now, comes a lot more There's There's an argument in there. I mean, it's not, it's not the case that there is no consequence whatsoever. <coughs> One can go back and say, well, who is really responsible for that? And in the same way that um, I described Joel's lack of damage from people downloading from him because there were a thousand others, it tracks back down the cone to the original cedars, the people like Hamaki who established the availability when it wasn't there before. Those people, they're, they're causing some serious damage. And the industry, um, one could imagine the industry going after them fairly hard. That's the way the movie industry now really tries to hold down the, the, the seating of, of, of their um, IP. But the problem that the music industry had is that they themselves were the seeders. They put out all their music in digital files, totally open on CDs. That's it. They, they seeded the digital environment with massive numbers of their songs. And after that, the process of it becoming part of the exchange on the net was inevitable. And even after that process was established, the industry continues to put out its stuff in completely open format. So then, under the same line of logic, would you say that um, someone who puts out this property that they don't actually protect is, it's okay for someone else to take that property because of if, if, you're, if you're in a situation of fairness uh, and you're making judgments, I would say it's definitely something to be taken into account. That is, if, if you're trying
trying to judge the fairness between the copyright holder and the consumer. And on the one hand, you have a copyright holder that really tried to take care, locked the property up in the safe, shut the door at night, and all that stuff, and the consumer broke in through it. Then that's one thing. But if you've got somebody who leaves it out in the front yard and doesn't bother to put a lock on it, and um, you know everybody's hungry, and there's the food right there, um, the fairness argument starts to go the other way. And uh, what I was hoping for with the jury, and that's where we really got tagged, I was hoping to be able to make a fairness argument. I thought, I thought a jury could understand a fairness argument as one of balance between the two and not just open and shut where it doesn't make any difference what the copyright holder's done. They're entitled to get their nickel no matter what. All right, one more. I was gonna, I was gonna ask a little question, harking back to the earlier point of, you know, if Joe was out there, uh, and I wonder how much of a function of the damages was the fact that Joe maybe uh, other people were downloading the song, so in that way they were being hurt because other people were getting it from him. But, but you said if Joe wasn't out there, there were plenty of other users, there were plenty of other people that people were downloading the songs from. So are the real culprits here the file sharing companies? I know they went after an extra in Rockford, but have they done enough to police them, the original people who are kind of supporting this interface? Well, I guess I'd, I guess I'd in a, some sense, say sort of yes. It was only after, uh, it, first of all, the, the industry recognized the file sharing companies as the first targets that they wanted to go after. It was only when they were frustrated in going after those targets that they turned to consumers. The key one was Grokster. What happened in 2002, uh, one or two, um, first you had Napster, they knocked down Napster, then along comes Grokster, and Grokster was really aggressive in trying to get the whole Napster crowd to come over and use Grokster. So they were, were really aggressively advertising, you know, come here to get your download, you know, that's kind of thing. And the industry went after Grokster. They lost in the district court. They appealed to the Ninth Circuit. They lost in the Ninth Circuit. And it was only after they lost in the Ninth Circuit that they were just in desperate shape and started this campaign of suing consumers. It was after the campaign was started that they got to the Supreme Court. They did At the time they started the campaign, they had no idea the Supreme Court was even going to take the case. But eventually the Supreme Court takes the case and decides their way. If Grokster had been decided their way to begin with, we never would have seen these lawsuits. But once they were embarked on the campaign, they were ready to let it run. All right, thanks all very much.